came to Indonesia about 20, 24 years ago. When I came down here, I really loved it. So uh, I called up my girlfriend at the time and I said, sorry, babe, I'm not coming back, you know, that's it. And <laughs> really? then, uh, what about all your stuff? And I just keep it. So we were like pirates. You know, yeah. we were like a little pirate organization, a pirate ship kind of going around <laughs> the sea. But then as you develop, you, as you move through the various stages of your organization getting bigger, so you go from becoming pirates all the way through the various <laughs> stages until you come like almost the Navy. In general, I mean, we use one word, we, it's trust. So we want basically mm. people, if they book our hotels or stay in hotels or work for us as a company, mm. it's a company we can trust in. Punya cita-cita kerja di hotel waktu umur 8 tahun, sekarang memiliki jaringan hotel terbesar di Asia Tenggara. John M. Flood, pria yang 24 tahun lalu datang dari Irlandia ke Indonesia untuk membangun bisnis perhotelan. Semua ini berawal dari impian masa kecilnya yang melihat hotel sebagai tempat yang glamor. Namun tidak seperti impian masa kecil yang makin meredup seiring berjalannya waktu, mimpi John justru semakin kuat. Ia mulai menapaki karir di bidang perhotelan dan FMB pada umur 14 tahun, hingga akhirnya datang ke Indonesia pada tahun 1999. Melihat potensi bisnis di Indonesia, John memutuskan untuk tinggal, menetap, dan mengubah warga negaraannya menjadi WNI. Berbekal nilai kepercayaan Archipelago International yang dibangun John bersama rekannya lebih dari 20 tahun lalu, kini sudah membuahkan hasil yang manis. Perusahaannya telah melahirkan 11 brand perhotelan yang berada di 200 lokasi dengan total lebih dari 45.000 kamar. Hal ini membuat Archipelago International menjadi salah satu jaringan hotel yang diperhitungkan secara global. Meski sempat terdampak pandemi, hotel-hotel di bawah naungannya mampu bertahan dan bangkit lebih kuat dari sebelumnya. Pak John, thank you for having us today. Uh, how are you? Very good, Kinoy. Nice to meet you. Thanks very much for having me on the show. Nice to meet you too. And then like, uh, we will have a, like a lot of chat, but it's a casual chat. So uh, first of all, I want to ask you about the childhood, because everything starts from childhood, right? Uh, we heard that you want to work in a hotel since like eight years old. Eight years old, yeah. I think I was eight years old when I decided to I wanted to be in the hotel business. So after that, everything was kind of geared towards hotels. <laughs> Why hotel? Because like uh, a child uh, dream, like actually become a doctor, an astronaut, a pilot. Why you want? Yeah, I always thought hotels were just glamorous. You know, every time we kind of I went past the hotel and where I was from in Dublin, mm -hmm. or uh, we visited a hotel or mm -hmm. restaurants. I just thought like the, the restaurant trade, the hotel business was really glamorous. Mm. So uh, I was always really fascinated by it, and then um, always looked forward to it. If we went to restaurants on a Saturday or a Sunday with the family, it was always like for me it was the time of the week, you know. Mm. And there was also a couple of shows on TV. There was, a, there was a, one show called Upstairs Downstairs, which was about like a Victorian family in England. Okay. And about like the front of house and the back of house and what happened there. And I always thought that was interesting. And they always had like tuxedos and <laughs> bow ties and everything very glamorous, you know. And then there was another mm -hmm. show called uh, Fantasy Island. Yeah. Which was, uh, they have a show, it's a repeat on at the moment, but mm. years ago was a show called Fantasy Island where people went to this island and there was a guy called Mr. Work. And he looked after all the guests and they stayed in this hotel and he made all their fantasies come true and he kind of sorted things out. So I always thought that was amazing. So I always thought like, you know, for me, that was the ideal of a GM in a hotel. <laughs> he could make, you know, people come to the hotel, he looks after them and they have a great mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. and everything's really interesting and they have like, it's really like cool place, you know. So yeah, I just really got into it, you know, and then I was into cooking at the time, you know, from mm -hmm. a young age. Oh, so so like I was, cooking. yeah, I always cooked. Yeah, I always like, you know, bake cakes and uh I got angry with my mother if she didn't, uh, you know, <laughs> one time I was like, for example, she was making apple tarts. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, I'll make some pastry as well. Mm -hmm. And then I made some pastry and then I put it in the oven and it came out and then it was like totally different to hers. Yeah. And I said, why is mine so different? Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, because you didn't put the, the butter in it. She only gave me flour and water to put together <laughs> and I made like it, so it came out really hard, you know. Okay. And I got really angry even at six years old, I think I was at the time I was jumping up and down, mm. telling her why didn't she give me the right recipe and stuff okay. like that. So I was like totally like pfft. But next you like really work in a hotel or in like Yeah, I started uh, when I was younger then uh, wanted to make some money. 
as a kid. So in those days, you could work in a bar, for example, as a waiter. So uh, a lounge boy, whatever it was called. So I used to do that. Where I went to a bar after after school, start working there as a, as a waiter, and then after that, I got talking to the cook in the bar. They used to do a lot of like pub food, which is very good quality. Mm. I asked the guy, you know, can I work in the kitchen, you know, mm. after school? So he's like, yeah. So I used to go over there after school when I was 14, 15, and start working in the kitchens. So I cooked the food, and then I'd run downstairs and I served the food, and so I did all that kind of stuff. So then after I finished school, then I I start working in a hotel in Dublin, like mm. straight away, you know. But basically from 14, every day after school, from 4 o'clock until 11 o'clock at night, I used to work in, in restaurants yeah, or bars. Okay. But then, like, you work, you have worked without being paid, right? Why is that? Uh, paid a little, yeah, I was, I was paid then when I was uh, younger. And then um, you're going on about, the, like, later on working for free. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I used to, um, after I went to, after I finished hotel school in Dublin, I finished that on a Friday and Saturday. Yeah, yeah. I was already in London working. I went. I got a flight to London on the next morning when I was about 20 years old. Mm. Um, and then when I was in London, and I was working full time in some hotels. And then on my days off or after work, I'd go and work in other places. So when I was in London for two years, I worked in a maybe a hundred different well, different places, doing okay. yeah everywhere from <laughs> you know Stringfellow's nightclub, Hard Rock Cafe, Buckingham Palace. Uh, air shows, catering things, weddings, uh, Windsor Castle, all kinds of places just like to get experience. So I'd work basically every day my normal job, mm -hmm. plus then I'd go to another place to work. And then on the weekends, on Saturdays and Sundays, I used to go and work in different hotels and stuff. So, But also even when, because um, I always wanted to get into like hotel management. Yeah. So even when I was working in F&B, for example, on the weekends, I'd work, I'd go to the hotel I was working in and then work in the front office or work in you know, different areas like housekeeping or whatever like that. So I could learn like all the different systems in the, in the different hotels. Yeah. Was it hard because like you work in oh, yeah. so many places yeah, yeah. and then uh, there must be like exhausting. Well, I mean, that's what, that's what I did. I mean, I always kind of like had a, had a plan what I wanted to do. Mm. And then uh, I just knew like if you want to do it, like you need all the experience you can yeah. in as many different yeah. places as you can. So uh, for me, it was, it was tiring, but I mean... I basically worked from seven o'clock in the morning until eleven o'clock at night yeah. every day for for that particular two years. Mm -hmm. That's all I did, just work. But it was enjoyable. I mean, you know, you meet nice people, the yeah. interaction with the guests. I mean, I was basically like a hobby. I was doing what I like to do. So yeah. I had my paid job. But even when you're working in places for free, I mean, they still give you food. You can have a shower. <laughs> I mean, you don't get a lot of money in hotels in those days, right? Yeah. In London, I mean, your minimum salary and stuff like that. But I mean, it's good experience, yeah. So. Because so you want it. to get the experience. Get like, the experience, yeah. And then you want to learn the whole process right. of like, running. A whole running day. everything. Everything from top to bottom, like food and beverage, like the kitchens, the restaurants, the front office, the housekeeping mm. areas, the mm. engineering, mm -hmm. you know, how it all fits together. Yeah. So all this experience kind of like helped me later on in years. But I mean, even on a day off, for example, I used to pick a restaurant that I go to and spend all my money in that particular restaurant. If it was a Michelin star restaurant or some oh. interesting concept, I would go there so I could also experience it from a guest point of view, which mm. I always thought was important. It was, you know, it's, it's much different if you're experiencing these things as a guest than, than just working. Yeah. So mm. that's what I, but I've, I've always done that. I mean, even on holidays mm. now, I mean, I'll, I'll pick places where I can go to a hotel and experience the hotel or experience mm. the F&B and different concepts and stuff like that. And, yeah. you know, I'll be taking notes. I'll be going around the hotel, okay. having looks, sit in the front office for or the lobby for one or two hours and just, yeah. just look at how it flows, see what goes on, mm. see what kind of guests come through, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Any particular interesting experience? Many, you know, but... Big one. <laughs> no, eh, no, I mean, not really. It's just over like an accumulation of all this experience over the years. Like, so mm. when you come to do your own stuff I mean you, you have a lot of stuff to draw on you know mm. so I'll have like big files of different pictures I'll take for different things over the years so I, st I still have all the stuff I mean all the stuff I built up over the years I still have yeah, all that yeah yeah so I keep it yeah so because you, you're still doing it right experience still do it every day everything. yeah every day every day looking for different stuff I mean if, we, if I go on holidays different places or going around hotels in Jakarta or Bali mm. or Indonesia, you can, mm. you know, you find some good stuff, you find some bad stuff, even on the bad stuff, I'm like, <laughs> I'll send a memo to the, our guys, like, hey, make sure we don't do this, make sure yeah. we do this, yeah, yeah. make sure we have this in place, yeah, yeah. these kind of systems, you know, so you can, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? Okay. And then, like, uh, 
when will uh, when you start uh, staying in Indonesia? I came to Indonesia about 20, 24 years ago. So at the time I was in Copenhagen mm. and there was a guy there. He asked me to come down and help him with a villa property that he had in Bali. Mm. I was only supposed to be for three or six months mm. originally. So, mm. But then when I came down here, I really loved it. So uh, I called up my girlfriend at the time and I said, sorry, babe, I'm not coming back, you know, that's it. And <laughs> really? then, uh, what about all your stuff? And I just keep it. <laughs> so um, well, I, when I left Dublin the first time I had, mm -hmm. when I was 20, I had uh, one bag and 80 pounds when 80 I went pounds. to London. Yeah. So then I built up some stuff when I was in London and in Paris and Copenhagen. But mm -hmm. when I left Copenhagen, then I only came to Bali with one bag and maybe 200 pounds. <laughs> so after all those years, all the stuff I left, the apartment, the car, everything's like, pfft, So you're was from gone. Dublin working in yeah, London? Yeah, first I went from Dublin and I went to London for a couple of years. Yeah. And then after that, I went to Paris for a couple of years. Working in a hotel too? Always, yeah, hotels. And then uh, after that, I went to Copenhagen mm -hmm. for five years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I worked in some nice places, nice hotels, good restaurants. Yeah. Had a lot of different experiences, but always like, just always working, working, working. Yeah, so <laughs> that's why for us, like, it's like New Year's Eve or Christmas yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. Like, I've never had those off. Like, I have them off now, but in those, uh, until I was maybe 40 years old, I never had like a New Year's yeah. Eve off or a Christmas off. I always worked. Because that was like big banquets. You could make extra money. You could get some <laughs> new experience. You could do some stuff. So I worked every chance I got, you know. Ooh, the tiring. <laughs> <laughs> All good fun. Yeah. Like, you you were in Indonesia for like 99? About 99, yeah. So uh, I came down after, after Christmas. So when they, you know, they had the economic crisis in 98, the what? fall of Suharto. Mm. And so... But I mean, you didn't have the internet really in those days. So people used to say to me, oh, you're going to Bali and it's very yeah. dangerous down there, you know, da, da, da. And I was like, no, no, it's no problem. It's Bali, you know, it's yeah. different than Indonesia. <laughs> but I didn't really know, I didn't really get it that Bali was like part of Indonesia. So and then I came down here, I was like, oh. What was Bali uh, situation Then yeah, It was good, time. it was good. Yeah, it was good. It was nice. There was no problem, actually. It was very, but business at the time was a bit quiet. Because a lot of people weren't going there. But over time, it was good. But it was just very enjoyable. It was a great experience mm. for me because I'd never been to Asia before. So your first experience to Asia is to Bali? To Bali, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because usually when I worked in Europe, for example, I just always worked around Europe. You know, if mm -hmm. I was working in Denmark or yeah. I, I, then I, on holidays because I didn't have much money, you'd get the train to Germany or get yeah. to Poland or yeah. Russia or whatever. So it's do stuff like that. basically like you're hopping from one country to another. You... you you go by train and then you, you go somewhere very far to... Uh, yeah, because somebody else was paying for the ticket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was okay. But I didn't, I didn't have the money at the time to mm. you know, get a flight to Asia, you know what I mean? That wasn't really mm. on my radar. Mm. So but somebody offered me that, and I was like, hey, sure. So what was the difference? What is the difference Bali then, like Indonesia then and now, according to you? It's just much more, I mean, the middle class obviously is a lot, is a lot better. I mean, at the time in Bali, I mean, even like a lot of the focus was on foreign tourists mm. whereas now like the focus is on domestic tourists because the jakarta market mm. going to bali is just so big now but before like the focus wasn't really on the jakarta market it was like a secondary kind of okay. of importance but now it's like i mean in bali i mean in particular they i think they focus more now on you know the four million domestic market yeah. i mean there's four million people you know indonesians traveling to bali every year where you get maybe two million foreign foreign mm -hmm. visitors yeah so the domestic market now is much bigger than the international mm -hmm. market yeah is that the uh, the potential that potential that uh makes you build archipelago today like yeah well, i mean what the, was the story what was the story well the original i mean after i was maybe after i've been here a couple of years i was doing finishing off my mba yeah and then i met a, a guy called charles brookfield mm -hmm. by the company here at the time and then we talked about hotels mm -hmm. Um, and his business and so forth. And he had a, he had a company here at the time. Yeah. And um, he said to me, well, when you finish your MBA, you know, come and work for me. Mm. So we became friends. And then before I came to work for him, when I was doing finishing off the thesis for my MBA, yeah. we used to meet every afternoon and talk about hotels and hotel business in general. And, yeah. if you, you, know, you know, what could potentially be the future of a hotel business mm -hmm. in Indonesia, you know, so... We used to talk and then I'd go home and I'd write it up, you know, I mean, my thesis for the, the MBA was building a sustainable hotel chain in Indonesia. That oh, was the final thesis. Yeah. And that was basically, that turned into the business plan for 
archipelago. Mm. So, and we still run that. It was like a Whoa. twenty, it was a twenty-year <laughs> business plan. Yeah, I had like, okay, if we do this, we'll have like the different brands. Yeah. And at the time, um, budget airlines were getting popular. Yeah. Like Lion Air was getting popular, mm. and Air Asia was getting popular. Mm. And then they were, you know, also getting rid of the fiscal tax for yes. overseas. Yes. So there was a lot more. So we were saying, well, you know, for the hotel business, they'll need budget hotels. Mm -hmm. So then we developed like a budget hotel brand, like Fave Hotels. Fave, and, then... and we said, okay, we need, you know, the, the sweet spot for us would be in the, in the, in the mid class, like three to four star hotels. Okay. So we, most of our focus was on three and four star hotels. But basically, we, you know, we started off with that. We started off small, mm. and we started Archipelago, and then mm. went on from there, yeah. So Charlie was like, um, you know, he'd had a lot of experience in the hotel business, mm. but he's also, uh, he previously, he was an auditor with Coopers and Librant when he was younger. So he has a very strong financial mm. background, and he audited a lot of different businesses. So he has a lot of different knowledge about how different businesses run and yeah. structured and set up. So for me, that was always fascinating, and he's a really cool guy, you know? So mm. it was always like... I saw him as someone who could be, really be a good mentor for me, yeah. you know. So, you know, he'd be the, you know, come up with some ideas and mentor me. And then mm -hmm. I'd like, you know, I was finishing my MBA. So I was really, you know, hot to trot and still young. Yeah, I was yeah. maybe 30, 31 or 32 at the time. So I had a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. So setting up like all the different bits and pieces that would have to go into this is mm -hmm. a lot of work in the beginning. So that's what I did. So even now, like, I mean, I'm less busy now than I was yeah. 20 years ago when we had only like a couple of hotels because you know all the systems basically are in place now so now it's just like adjusting or making you know fine tuning mm. systems and stuff like that but basically all the all the hard work all, from my side mm -hmm. all the systems and you know procedures and all that stuff was was set up like 15 to 20 years ago mm. so that was the reason why you want to work with Charlie because like he has a lot of experience like in financial things like yeah, he's a lot of experience, but he's also like he had a he had a good vision, but he just needed somebody to put it in, help him put it yeah. in place, you know. So yeah. he couldn't really do it by himself. I couldn't so, do it by yeah, myself. Yeah. So we we kind of formed this like, you know, a, a partnership, but it worked out really well. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, that he he brought a lot to the table, and I brought a lot to the table, yeah. and so we were able to kind of develop it like that together, you know. So uh, yeah, it worked out really well. I mean, we have different opinions on stuff, but we've never had like in. 20 years together in business, mm. we've never had an argument, you know, an argument over stuff. We just yeah. talk things out and ideas and in general, we can always find a consensus, you know? Yeah. And I mean, even if I don't agree and it's like, it could be one small thing. I mean, what difference does that make over 20 years of business? It's like, yeah, whatever. So, yeah. I mean, even if I don't agree with it, we'll go along or sometimes he doesn't agree with it, he'll go along because I mean, mm. over the lifespan of the whole company, big picture wise, it's mm. a very small thing. But just in general, I mean, for most things, we'd be very much aligned in, in how we want to do it, you know? Yeah. And then we can talk it through and say, okay, look at the pluses and the minuses and, yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah, we have a great relationship, works out really well. He's a great guy and we get on really well, you know, so. Mm. Like many people, including me at first, think that Archipelago International is like a foreign company, but actually it is an Indonesian, Indonesian company. Indonesian company, yeah. yeah. I mean, originally we started off, I mean, I was, I'm an Irish citizen and Charlie's American, but yeah. maybe 14 years ago, I think we took uh, Indonesian citizenship, so. Then we changed the company to mm -hmm. a local Indonesian company and because mm -hmm. we thought like our future is in Indonesia. We so could see the potential of Indonesia. So you both became Indonesian in citizens. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it was great. I mean, that was, I think, one of the best decisions we made, mm -hmm. you know, big picture. Because you are sure of the business of Archipelago or like yeah, I mean, hotel we just, industry in Indonesia or like any other reason? Yeah, we just, I mean, we saw, we just, we saw our future as in Indonesia. I mean, we like living here. We like the people. Yeah. We like the culture. Yeah. It's a great place. I mean, and the potential for what we do, the business yeah. we do is, is really good. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you're working in a hotel, for example, in, mm. in Paris, if, even if it's a five-star hotel, mm. you check in and you want someone to carry your bags. I mean, there's no one there to carry your bags or service you or show no you around. One? I mean, no, nobody. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, there's your bags. There's the lift. See you over there, you know, but in Indonesia, mm. I mean, even in a two star, three star hotel, people still expect somebody to carry yes. their bags or that's the service, you know, so the culture, yeah, yeah. the service culture here is, is much better and you can, you can do more stuff here yeah. in the hotel business. I mean, it's not just about money. It's about, for us, it's about providing good service, you know, building the best in class mm. for the different mm. brands that we have. If it's a two star, five star, I mean, we still want like the best in class service mm. for two star, three star hotels, you know, so in Indonesia and Asia in general, you can do that. Yeah. yeah. But other places in the world like like Europe where I'm from or the states where Charlie's from 
you can't do that anymore. That that service is gone and will never return because you know salaries are just too expensive. Mm. You just can't find the staff that are that interested in working in hotels anymore. Yep. So, but in Indonesia and Asia, you, yeah, you can still run like a proper business and run a real like hospitality business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the key to manage hotel is the service, the hospitality, right? Yeah. That's it. That's basically it. You know, service is you know having a a total service mindset, mm. you know, and then getting guest feedback, finding out like in general from the very beginning, okay, mm. we want to build this brand, we want to build this product, okay, what does the market need? Yeah. And then look for a space in the market and then try and build a product or a brand or a concept that kind of fits that mm. like a lot of people will want, you know. Mm. So it doesn't have to be too specialist, but in, in our kind of business, we're looking for mostly volume in the three and the four star. So yeah. for us, we need like volume. So it's what the average person wants instead of like a specialized market, like a boutique hotel mm -hmm. or, you know, something really unusual. Yeah. For mm -hmm. us, it's more like the, the mid-scale bread and butter kind of stuff, yeah. you know. So that's, that's for us is more important. Yeah. That applies to all uh, of Archipelago International's line of hotels? The brands, yeah. I mean, say, for example, we have 10 brands. Mm -hmm. So if it's two star or five star, in mm -hmm. general, they'd be like, I mean, some of them are a little bit more specialist, but for example, the Aston brand would be, you know, a very good quality, but yeah. you know, in general, we try and bring in like European Western standards, but add on top of that, then layer on Asian hospitality mm. and Asian design standards, Asian specs, Asian. Yeah. I mean, for us, most of the best design kind of concepts around the world at the moment, they're Asian and Indonesian has great designers, great architects. Yeah. Uh, they have great people for working in hotels. They still mm. have a service, service mindset, a hospitality mindset. Yeah. So then you can create something really interesting and good. Okay, and then like, uh, how is the development of Archipelago Hotel business right now? Development's very good. I mean, COVID was obviously a bit, bit slow on the yeah. hotel side, but what we did during COVID is we, we thought, you know, okay, the COVID itself, looking at it, is going. We we thought would take, you know, two years of the pandemic. Yes. You know, based on history, two years of pandemic, and then two years of recovery, and mm -hmm. then two years of boom. Yeah. So we said, okay, we have a two-year period to do some stuff. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we did was we kind of fine-tuned a lot of the brands that we already had. So they had a better, you know, product market fit going forward. Yep. Um, and the other thing we did was, okay, we'll need um, a property management system yeah. uh, software. And we had, you know, done some software before, but we said, okay, we'll try and develop that within the mm -hmm. two years. Mm -hmm. And we did that. We ended up building our own property management system okay. called Sentec. Yeah. Um, and that launched like last December mm -hmm. and it's in about 25 hotels already at the moment. And we're doing about five, five hotels per month at the moment. And next year we'll do about 10 hotels per month. So that's, that's going very well. So that was a big milestone for us because we come in as management, then we can also bring in our own property management system. Mm -hmm. So that I mean, we control that then the front of house, the back of house and the point of sale system. And the other thing we said we do is one of the things we did like many years ago is we centralized the e-commerce service. Um, mm. So we said during COVID it might be a good opportunity to um, offer that also to individual hotels or groups that are not not part of Archipelago because yeah. it's a good service that people need. Yeah. Because we said like after after COVID, you wouldn't have a lot of e-commerce staff in hotels, and a lot of hotels stopped their systems. You know, their their channel manager, the booking engine, they yeah. just turned them off. Yeah. So after COVID, hotels were just crying out for e-commerce staff, yield management yeah. staff, and the system. So we said, okay, we'll offer this service. So we set that service up as a service called Powered by Archipelago. Mm -hmm. And we have over 100 hotels now in that system. Mm -hmm. And we also do it, like, for example, in Vietnam, in Kenya, Australia, uh, UAE, Dominican Republic, Mexico. Yeah. So it's separate than the just pure management or of hotels like that. Yeah, so Powered by Archipelago goes very well, and we see great growth in that. It's a good mm -hmm. system. So we developed also as part of that, we developed our own um, Archipelago Arch CRS Central Reservation System, we call it, oh, which okay. it comprises basically, the you know, there's maybe 10 systems in it. Mm -hmm. But the three main components will be the booking engine, the channel manager and the, mm. the, the rate shopping tool, the yield mm -hmm. management system, you know, mm -hmm. and then we train the hotels themselves on how to use it. Yeah. Yeah. So that works out very well. So that was some of the things we kind of did. And we see a, a big growth for those in the future. Yeah. yeah. What is the result right now? Do you see any like good result from all of the efforts in like uh, integrating like technology? Oh yeah, and... yeah, for for sure. I mean, our one of the um, Jules Jules, who's Charlie's son, yeah. worked with us here for about. He's been here about twenty years, and he's a real 
really good tech guy, okay. uh, software, <laughs> builds all our tech. Um, and he's, you know, we have good conversations. We mm -hmm. see what, where the future is going and we try and work out, okay, what's happening, you know? Mm -hmm. And then we build systems and stuff for that. So the property management system we built for that. But we also, we also develop in-house our own apps, yeah. our own um, HR systems, our own asset management systems, mm -hmm. rate shopping tools, all kinds of stuff like that we'll develop in-house because we like to do our own stuff in-house. We don't get out outside consultants to do it. Oh, okay. We try and build the expertise ourselves in-house. You know, okay. by studying it, researching it, yeah. getting in some people, but we don't hire outside consultants. We just build it all in house, so we have all the capabilities that are in house yeah. that we need. Either if it's uh, software or IT or you know architectural design, interior mm. design, mechanical, electrical, plumbing design, and drafting, yeah. we have yeah. it all in house. So we do it ourselves. You know. Okay, so, so it's like more easier, right? Because if you hire like outside outside companies or outside people. Then, like, it's a lot of more problem or... In, in some ways, it's easier because, I mean, you don't have... If, if business goes down or you don't have enough volume yeah. of business, then, yeah. you know, you have to k keep bearing the costs, right? And to set mm -hmm. it all up in the beginning is a little bit expensive. Mm. You have to hire all these people. Yep. But the advantage of it is everything is very smooth in-house. So yeah. one of the things we focus on in particular is, you know, alignment mm. to make sure everybody is aligned in the company with, yes. you know, what our goals are, what the plan is, you know, mm. how all the brands fit together. How you know the architectural mm -hmm. fits with the interior, mm -hmm. fits with the mechanical, electrical, mm -hmm. plumbing, and then later on will fit with the service standards of that particular okay. brand we want. So alignment for us is, is is a key thing. So we make sure, like for example, we have the goals in the organization, but we make sure that everybody understands that the system is more important itself than the goals. Mm -hmm. So everybody's kind of make sure they're aligned towards the goals, but working to improve the system every day. Mm -hmm. So any plans to go to open like new hotels or yeah we have um probably another in indonesia we have another 50 hotels under various stages of construction from design yeah. to uh, almost opening soon um, 50 50 more yeah so we from have about a, sumatra to yeah all different places across yeah. i mean two star to four star yeah, five star hotels yeah. different locations different cities i mean yeah. it depends you know when you're building a hotel are looking at the particular location or market. Mm, I mean, mm. then you figure out, okay, we need a 100 room, room two star hotel would be best here, or a 300 room five star hotel. Yeah. I mean, there's variations depending on the market needs, you know? Yeah. So then overseas, we're expanding into, um, you know, Dominican Republic. We're doing hotels there now in the, okay. the Americas. Uh, Mexico yeah. is big for us, and then Cuba is okay. uh, over there. So in the Middle East, we're seeing a lot. And then we have some hotels opening up in Saudi Arabia soon. They'll be open up in Mecca, Jeddah, Medina. Wow. And okay. they'll be coming with uh, two of our brands, uh, Aston and Alana. Okay. When you plan to open a hotel in a city, a country, or a region, what are your considerations? Is there a demand? Is there a demand <laughs> for something we need? I mean, in the case of, for example, um, Saudi, I mean, there is a big demand because yeah. Indone Indonesia is like the second largest source market into, into Saudi Arabia, for yeah. example. Yeah. So in, in that case, when we were pitching to developers over there, mm. um, you know, it was a it was a good story. We we could tell, you know, I mean, we're the largest chain here. We have a yeah. good good brand recognition. So if you have Aston Hotels or Alana Hotels yeah, in yeah. Mecca, I mean, for sure we can bring in the Indonesian market. Yeah. yeah. So for that, for us, like that market in particular was a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. You can say we know Indonesians. We know Indonesians. We know the market. We have good sales. <laughs> uh, you know, distribution is one of the advantages we have here. Mm. And we're very well connected. We have a great network with all our travel partners, whether it's mm. OTAs or bed yeah, banks or yeah. travel agents or you know, um, Hajj or Umro organizers. So we can we can for sure bring in a lot of business to, mm. to Saudi Arabia in the future. Yeah. So we just need the hotels. <laughs> so fortunately, fortunately enough, um, there was developers over there who took us up on the offer yeah, and yeah. signed a deal. So by next year, we should have the first Archipelago hotels opening up in Saudi Arabia. So okay. that's kind of like basically what we look at. I mean, market market demand, mm -hmm. and if there's a fit for our product. That goes the same for in the Dominican Republic and Mexico. Yeah, Dominican Republic will be a little bit different. I mean, uh, for example, in in the Americas, we started off in Cuba. We were invited mm -hmm. over by the Cuban government to um, to do some hotels over there and try and bring in more of the Asian market because traditionally they'd be more focused on Spanish and European market because it's a Spanish speaking country. But yep. They were looking at bringing in some um, Asian operators, mm -hmm. and, and who could, you know, contract with Asian uh, outbound 
operators in, uh, mm. around Asia and China and stuff like that. Mm. So um, they contracted with us and we started doing hotels in Cuba about six years ago. Mm -hmm. um, due to various ups and downs and so forth, I mean, the COVID and all the rest and the hotels opening, I mean, now we're, we have four hotels open there. There's another two will open up towards the end of this year. Yep. Um, so business now should be, you know, you know flight volumes are coming back. Uh, mm. People are going more for long haul flights. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the future now, the business in Cuba will be better. But after we did Cuba, then we got a lot of requests then from people in the Dominican Republic, oh. which is a, a big market over there. It's um, like one of the, probably the top destination for the U.S. Yes. into the Caribbean. Yes. Um, it's, you know, politically, it's very stable. It's well structured. Mm. Legally, it's very good. So it's quite easy to do business there. So for Americans, for example, buying second homes or condo hotels in the Dominican Republic yeah. is very popular. So. Yeah. So we, we went in there, we have some deals over there. Um, you know, in that case, we do like, for example, a joint venture with a company over there mm. to do the management. They'll develop them and we'll manage them in a joint venture with them. Yeah. So it's different kind of business models we use if we're expanding overseas. Sometimes it could be like full on management. Sometimes it could be a licensing agreement. And sometimes it could be a, we set up a joint venture with them. Or mm. in some places, like for example, in Kenya, we do a lot of just powered by Archipelago. Yeah. And we also sell our uh, property management system over there. But we, we don't actually do management. So, okay. but depends what the different location wants, you know. So you see like the business is thriving after COVID? Yeah, for sure it's thriving. I mean, for, you know, there was a lot of businesses that kind of let staff go during COVID, mm -hmm. but we actually hired mm -hmm. more staff in particular, like where we wanted to expand in the e-commerce business and the software business yeah, planning for the future. Yeah, yeah. So for us afterwards, I mean, we, the products that we developed um, were like really well, really in demand, and in particular, like the property management system, the Powered by Archipelago service. Mm. And then also, I mean, it gave us a chance, you know, a two year quiet period to kind of almost set the reset button on a lot yeah. of stuff to, yeah. you know, re kind of polish the brands and refocus things a little bit. So we have a much better product market fit mm. with a lot of all the stuff. Whereas, like, if COVID hadn't come, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do that. We just had it kept yeah, you know, busy, yeah, busy, yeah. busy, busy, busy. But it yeah, just gave yeah. us a chance to like rejig kind of the organization a little bit. So after COVID, we came out much stronger as an organization mm -hmm. than we went into COVID, you know. Mm -hmm. And luckily at the time, we had enough, enough resources to keep things ticking over and be able to develop yeah. this, you know. So yeah. normally, like, we don't take a lot of money out of the company. We try and re we reinvest it into the company, yeah. you know, either it's developing software or expanding yeah, overseas yeah, yeah. and so forth. That's where, like, most of our money goes so we can... We can grow the business, grow our expertise, grow our mm -hmm. capabilities. Mm -hmm. So everything kind of goes like that. Mm -hmm. That's the general strategy we use. With the big uh, like business you have, like not just in Indonesia but also abroad, what is the uh, value you you want to like give every uh, all the time to the staff, like to the business or something? What are what are your values about running this uh, business? Yeah. Um, in general, I mean, we use one word, we, it's trust. So we want mm. basically people, if they book our hotels or stay in hotels or work for us as a company, mm. it's a company we can trust, you know, I mean, we, you know, they're going to, you know, for staff point of view, mm. you know, basically the offer is, look, you know, you come work for our company. Yep. This is what's in it for you. Yeah. And if things go well, this is what's in it for us. Mm. So it's like, you're going to get a good job. You're going to mm. get well paid. You're going to yeah. get salary increases. You're going to mm. get bonuses. You're going to be able to grow your expertise. You're going to be able to develop as a person, develop mm. in your, you know, your type of business that you do, whether yeah. it's in food and beverage part of the division mm. or the architectural part. So for us, that's, that's important, you know, and then, um, you know, for guests coming to hotels, for owners who are hiring us to manage their properties, I mean, we need to be a company that people can trust and we try and do that all the time. Yeah. So that's the one word for us would be trust, you know, Guests can trust that it's, you know, clean, safe, yeah, yeah. well organized. They're not going to get food poisoning. Everything's going to run <laughs> well. They're going to, you know, and then, you know, they're going to have a good time. It's an interesting yeah. brand. There's mm. something quirky mm. about the hotel that's a little bit more interesting. And it's yeah, not just yeah, like yeah. The typical kind of hotel, you know, and we try and do that from the two star to the five star. There's mm. always like something a little bit different, a little bit special mm. in the hotels, whether mm. it's in the design and the service and the way we do things, you know, so for us, that's important. Yeah. yeah. So the leadership? It's important to you? Leadership is key, yeah. I mean, everything starts at the top, you know. I mean, yeah. in the, you can start the lock in the beginning. Say, for example, we were six six or seven staff in the beginning, right, when the company yeah. started. Yeah. So we were like pirates. You know, yeah. we were like a little pirate organization, a pirate ship kind of going <laughs> around the sea. We were, this is the way we kind of see it ourselves almost, you know. It's like, 
you know, you can, everything's open. There's no rules mm. and regulation. You can, you can, you know, develop what you like. You have a blank page. Yeah. You can do what you like. There's, yeah. And there's no real risk involved because you're so small, you have nothing to lose, right? Yeah, yeah. But then as you develop, as you move through the various stages of your organization getting bigger, I mean, in the corporate office now, for example, we're up to like 200 staff in mm. the corporate office. But as an organization with staff in the hotels, we'd be maybe 20,000 people. So you go from becoming pirates all the way through the various <laughs> stages until you come like almost the Navy. Yeah. So once you become like the Navy, then you have to have admirals, commanders, captains, yeah, yeah, yeah. proper systems in place. Things have to run properly. So moving, you know, through the various sizes of the organization, you know, from a family size to like a tribe up to 100 people or a city mm. size mm. or a town size at 500 to a city size at 10,000, mm. you know, to a, an international organization like country size at 20, you know, 20,000 where you're, you know, quite a substantial yeah. organization. All these systems have to be put in place. We've gone from pirates to the Navy, but, you know, now <laughs> we're much more structured. You know, we have executives in the company now, not even from the hotel business, but we have people from the insurance business, from the yeah. banking business, so yeah. they can bring in, you know, different things for us. And different, in different insights, areas yeah. and different insights and stuff. And they have different experience in different businesses and stuff. Mm. So the core of us is, is hotels, but we have expertise and different mm. people from outside yeah. to make sure we run as a, as a, as a good Navy. <laughs> so um, what is your, how do you build relationship with your coworker and your, with your staff, of course? We have, um, I mean, basically we have like uh, four pillars. Mm. So one of them is, for example, uh, Kaizen which is yeah. constant improvement. Yeah. So we have that one. And the other one is what we call HAM, which is harmony, alignment, momentum. Okay. So they're the, they're the core principles, right? Mm. So as regards the staff, that would fall into the first one, which is harmony. Yeah. So we try and focus that all the staff are looked after. Mm. Nobody gets mistreated. Yeah. Everybody like, has a, you know, a very harmonious relationship within mm. the group. There's no, mm. we try and reduce like politics within the company and stuff yeah. like that. So basically, uh, Harmony. We try and har mm. make sure everybody's in a harmonious kind of way, mm -hmm. and that helps things going forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's how staff are are looked after. Harmony. <laughs> harmony. Okay. So, um, what is your opinion about uh, hospitality industry nowadays? There's a lot of hotels in Indonesia right now, and then like they offered a lot of concepts. What do you think of that? Oh, it's great. I mean, Indonesia at the moment has about you know, plus or minus twenty three thousand hotels. Mm. So, but a lot of them are maybe only seven or eight percent of them are actually branded. So, whereas if you, com you compare that with America, US market, mm. which is the most developed kind of like hospitality market in general in the world, right? Mm. So, they'd have about 50,000 hotels, and 80% mm. of those would be branded or connected to some kind mm. of reservation or central system. Yeah. yeah. So, Indonesia still has a lot of potential for, for branding because, you know, the general market, especially after COVID, the general market kind of demand is more towards like safety, yeah. security, cleanliness, yes. healthy, yeah. you know, places they can trust, right? Mm -hmm. So brands in general will offer, you know, you know, if you're going to a branded hotel, you feel like you can get like, you know, your bed's clean, your air conditioner is going to yeah, work, yeah, the hot yeah. water is going to work, the yeah. breakfast is going to be nice, the staff are going to be friendly. Yeah. So instead of, for example, if you're going to a town and you're going to an independent hotel, you're not really sure what you're going to get, you know, mm -hmm. at least with a brand, you can get like, Guarantee, almost a guaranteed kind of expectation mm. and you know a hotel you can trust for example but mm. that's kind of like where the market is going at the moment i mean people are going more towards branded branded products branded hotels mm -hmm. so they're, they're more like they can trust them yeah so the brand is the challenge in indonesia or well brands brands will develop i mean for example us accor yeah. marriott hilton all of our brands will will expand for sure mm -hmm. across the archipelago because it's also you know Apart from hotels you can trust, brands also bring in um, a bigger network. I mean, we have much bigger, you know, the bigger you are, the more of a network you have in yes. theory, right? But, you know, we, we, we would have a much bigger network with, you know, online travel agents, with yes. bed banks, with yeah. travel agents, yeah. with uh, government. Just mm -hmm. because we're bigger, we have a bigger reach, we have a bigger mm -hmm. network. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other thing then is uh, distribution channels. Mm. I mean, if you're bigger, a brand like us, for example, especially mm. a local brand, we have fantastic distribution channels. Mm. So we'd have a distribution advantage over independent hotels because we can, you know, we just have a bigger reach. We can distribute mm. bigger. So when you're running a race, I mean, in, in the hospitality business, yeah. you know, the faster you can distribute, the faster you can run. Mm. And we have the best distribution so we can run fastest. Yeah. So for us. <laughs> 
our, our possibility to expand it is very good, you know, because, mm. you know, our network is better, our distribution mm. is better. Mm. You know, we can bring in more business to hotels. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's the key, you know. Okay. Uh, about the expansion, like, I see uh, uh, Archipelago opens, like, hotels in second tier and third tier cities. What do you think about that? What are the reasons, like? A lot of it is to do it. I mean, a lot of the primary cities, like Jakarta. Yeah. Surabaya, Madame, big markets like Bali, they're already full of hotels. Mm. So mm. Um, I'm with the development with, uh, in Indonesia and also with like the, uh, you know, the, you know, the infrastructure that the government has put in place in the last 10 years, for example. Mm. I mean, if you take East Java as, a, as an example, yeah. I mean, a lot of the cities there before, like Solo, for example, would have been mm. a, not, not so busy. Yeah. But now with the good infrastructure, with the better train system, the better toll road system, I mean, busier. everything's everything's getting busier. It's easier for people to travel around on a journey that used to take six hours to go to a small town now mm. maybe take one hour, two hours. Yeah. So there's a lot more demand for that. It's easier just to get around. So, but also these cities are also developing. I mean, the economy in yeah. Indonesia in general is going very, very well. It's like yeah. it's a steady five to six percent every year. You know, COVID didn't have such a negative effect. Mm -hmm. Um. So these people are getting you know more wealthy. They want to travel more. Yes. Um. So that's why you see a lot more development. And again, people are demanding in these cities. Mm. They want to build up. Um, they want to have, for example, a branded hotel. They yeah. want to have a Starbucks. Yeah. They want to have a shopping mall. They want to, you know, the, the mayors and the governors in these cities or provinces. They want to have this stuff so they'll, you know, it brings in more investment into the city. Brings mm. in more investment into the province. Mm. You know, just puts the puts the province on the map, you know. Yeah. So that's why you're seeing like a lot more development, in particular, of branded hotels, whether mm -hmm. it's you know, two star, or three star, or four star, probably not so much five star in the secondary and tertiary cities, but definitely you know the sweet spot, three star, four three, star hotels. Four star, yeah. You see a lot more development, especially branded hotels. Yeah. Yeah. What are the challenges in like in different cities or different regions to open a hotel, like? For, for example, in Sumatra, in Kalimantan, in Sulawesi, or in Nusa Tenggara, or Java, what are the challenges? Well, from the, from the beginning, I mean, the, you know, you'd have like, it goes on a, on a, on a curve, basically. I mean, the easiest mm. place to build hotel would be in, you know, construction-wise would be in Jakarta, because all the contractors are here, all the, a lot of materials are okay. here, or Surabaya, for example, it's easy yeah. to get the stuff. The worst would be, for, or the most difficult, for example, would be on an island. Or Labuan Bajo, for example. Yeah. <laughs> so, for example, if you're in Labuan Bajo, like construction over there would cost you 40 or 50 percent more to do it. Because of the transport. No, oh, because the transport. One, you know, contractors don't yeah. want to go there. Yeah. It's very far for them. Yeah. Also, you have to ship in all the materials, whether yes, it's yes. you know concrete, cement, wood, yeah. everything like that is more expensive to bring in. Then, when you're operating it, you also need it because you know, for example, if you're in Jakarta, the staff can just find their own housing. If you're in Labuan Bajo yeah. or Flores, for example, you have to also build staff housing. Mm -hmm. And that could be for a four-star, five-star hotel. It could be staff housing up to 200 people, wow. you know, plus staff housing, plus, you know, feeding them, plus entertaining <laughs> them, you know, badminton course, table tennis. And then mm -hmm. you have to fly all these people in and out once a year. Yeah. So you, have, you also have a lot more turnover of those kind of staff in Jakarta, like, People have their families here. They're happy to stay here. Yeah. If you hire somebody for a hotel in Labuan Bajo, for example, yeah, maybe they'll stay six months or a year. But as soon as they get a job in Bali or Jakarta, they're gone. Yeah. So you have like, you know, 100, 150 percent turnover of staff every year. So then you need, you know, a bigger recruitment process, a bigger training process, mm. a bigger HR division. Mm. You know, you don't have that continuity of service and longevity. Yeah. So it's, that's the kind of problems you deal with. Mm. And as well as that, then, you know, you need to have, for example, in Jakarta, you can get deliveries every day. Yeah. Labo and Bajo, you might get deliveries once a month, yeah. once a week, for example. So you yeah. need, you know, more logistics. You need uh, bigger storage, more mm. cold storage, mm. more stores, more people to handle the stores. You need more stuff like that, and it's mm. more expensive. So it could be twenty or thirty percent more expensive to get the products to that location, and it will cost you twenty or thirty percent more to store all that stuff. Yeah. So and then you have a lot more wastage, of course, that goes along with it. But so it this is like it's a logistical nightmare if you like in, in those kind of places but you know you can do it i mean you can get higher rates there is some advantages but it's just logistically it's very very difficult yeah but it's worth the potential right for some people if you if you can get i mean not everybody's going to win it's not a winner mm. you know it's it's a very kind of nuanced market so maybe from 10 hotels maybe three of those hotels will be doing well four will be doing okay and mm. then three will be doing badly mm. 
-hmm. that's that's what you'd expect in a kind of a market like that, you know. But not everybody will be doing well. But again, the branded hotels will have an advantage because yes. they'll get, you know, they have a bigger network, they have a distribution advantage, yeah. they have a better, you know, product market, you know, balance product in place to fit the market. Yeah. So and then people in general will, will book again when they're going to places like Labo and Bajo. Yeah. They'll book a branded hotels because they don't want to go there and then be disappointed that yeah. you know there's bed bugs or, or the electricity <laughs> doesn't work or the water's brown or they don't want to have those kind of problems. So yeah. for, the, for those kind of reasons, you'll get more branded hotels and they will perform better. They'll have mm. a better rate, better occupancy. Mm. They'll run better yeah. and staff will stay there longer because yeah. they have a better career path if they're in a branded hotel. Right, right. We heard that you open a hotel in Banten, right? Yeah, I mean, we liked uh, one of the things we decided to do a few years ago was open our own hotels. But mm. one of the problems we have in doing it is we can't really open our own hotels in locations where we have managed hotels because okay. it's, it's not fair. It's not fair on those owners. I yes, mean, even if we fair. don't, you know, as soon as we get one or two percent occupancy, mm. those owners would be complaining, going, "Oh, you're putting all your business <laughs> in your own hotel." So yeah, I, we don't, we wouldn't do that. But I mean, we understand. So. We had to find a location where um, we do some uh, of our own hotels, but away from uh, managed hotels. So a few years ago, I was down in uh, I was down in Anyer, mm -hmm. and um, I couldn't find a good hotel to stay. But I really loved the area, so I yeah. thought oh, this would be a good place. So we got some land on the beach, and we built a nice, you know, nice kind of small mm -hmm. hotel mm -hmm. that went well. Um, then while we were there, then we we got another location then in Chiligon. We yep. didn't have a hotel there, so mm -hmm. it was like. We can see that as the kind of commercial kind of capital yeah. of, of Banten and yes. a nice nice city. So we built a, an Aston boutique hotel there. Mm -hmm. And then after that, then they in Sarang, we got another opportunity. They moved um, the mayor's office and the governor's office a little bit outside the city, mm -hmm. built new facilities. Yeah. So we got some land very close to that. Yeah. Um, and then we built a kind of a convention hotel. So that will mm -hmm. cater to all the government needs that are there. Because the yeah, problem with yeah. Sarang, it didn't have like a very good international branded hotels. For, um, business for business meetings, for business meetings, for bringing in investment into the into yeah. the city, into the province itself, you know, the mm. closest you get was Tangerang. Yeah. Um. So we yeah we built a hotel and convention center in in Sarang. Um, mm -hmm. Opened up last month. It's already doing very well. Got a lot of bookings. Got a lot of demand. Um. Places like previously they would have had meetings in Tangerang. Mm -hmm. Now they're all, now they're moving mm -hmm. to Sarang. Mm -hmm. Um. So the governor is very happy. The mayor is very happy. <laughs> so it's yeah you can you can do a lot more stuff there. So it's, it's for us it's great for the province. I mean we're yeah. able to you know yeah, we're yeah. building international hotels for uh, Chiligon in mm -hmm. Anyer for the tourism yes. and dealing with the Krakatoa industrial estate yes. meetings from there, and then in Sarang then we're catering a lot for the government you know to help build up the mm -hmm. province. But it, it all helps you know I mean it helps. We had an investment. Uh, a conference over there in the first month, mm -hmm. we had a lot of people coming in looking to invest mm -hmm. in, in Sarang and Bantan province, which was great. So we were happy yeah. we were able to help with that. Yeah. So it's a good decision. Good decision. So, <laughs> you know, you never know. I mean, when you're, you know, you can have a theory and you can have ideas looking mm -hmm. at the market and say, oh, yeah, we think it's going to be like this. And you can mm -hmm. be confident. Yeah, it's going to be like this. Should we build this and that? But I mean, until the rubber hits the road, until, you, you know, the thing actually opens, and you know the market reacts. You never really know. I mean, then after that, you have to you, you might have to fine tune, or it's very rare that you'll hit it like right on the head straight away. You know, mm -hmm. but luckily with this one, it's like it's it's going very well. But I mean, later, you know, you might need to build more rooms or some more meeting rooms or mm -hmm. a few extra facilities. Mm -hmm. But um, in general, I mean, that was probably like ninety eight percent like a good concept for that particular market. Yeah. Okay. But. It's still a worry for me. It's a worry even until the day it opens. It's a worry. It's like, oh man, I hope this fills up. You know, it's like, okay, but it fills up. <laughs> it fills up. I'm lucky, so like, okay. <laughs> now, um, I want to uh, know about like you have years of experience in hotel industry, but nowadays uh, Airbnb is like everywhere. What do you think about that? Is that a uh, like a threat to hotel industry, or is a complementary to? A little, a little bit. I mean, obviously, if you're taking, uh, it depends on the market. I mean, Airbnb in Indonesia never really got that popular. Um, mm. So it doesn't really, in Indonesia for our key market here, like our base market, it doesn't, really, it doesn't really affect us. Mm. I mean, I think it affected mostly markets in um, where there's like huge demand, like Barcelona, Amsterdam, New York. Mm. But even then, a lot of the places have stopped Airbnb. They're not allowed to function there anymore mm. because it just increases the costs of homes. And rental for homes, yeah. so the people living in those cities can't rent anymore because, mm. you know, owners are just renting them out on Airbnb at higher rates. 
Mm -hmm. So, um, but in general, I mean, people expected that it would have some effect, but in, you know, there was a little bit of uh, an effect, but overall, not really. It's yeah. just a different kind of thing because Airbnb offers a kind of a product, you know, two bedrooms, three bedrooms that hotels in general don't really offer. Yeah. So, I mean, most hotels are built with 15% of the rooms would be suites. But even then, it might, you might have connecting rooms, but even then it doesn't really give you like a kitchen, or like mm. a living room, a central mm -hmm. living room and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a kind of a different product. So I think it's helped people travel more mm -hmm. rather than, you know, it's not really the same market being spread out between hotels and Airbnb. I think it's mm -hmm. helped grow the market mm -hmm. a bit more. So families, you know, two or three kids, for example, or groups of people who previously like wouldn't go because it's a hassle booking a hotel yeah. to fit their needs. Yeah. Now they can book an Airbnb. And then, you know, at the same time, maybe they'll spend a few nights in Airbnb in one destination. And at the same time, they'll also stay in a hotel. So it brings more people in, you know. But I think overall what happened with tourism globally is that it just, it's expanding, like, immensely. So there's just so much demand in, tour, you know, in tourism sector that you can fill it in, like, very, quite easily, you know. There's, I mean, there's massive demand in most places, you know. Okay. Like, now... I want to know about like uh, your vision of future. How do you manage a lot of people and then a lot of business? What is your key, key of success? Is it your talent or is it your persistence? Or yeah, pers I mean, I think any entrepreneurs, Charlie, myself, you asked us or any entrepreneur around the world, I mean, perseverance is the key. Mm. If you're setting up a business, Unless you're setting up a business that's just going to go public in a few years' time. I mean, there is like a finite like, mm. period of time where you have to work hard. But if mm. you're building up a business like us that's, you know, going for the long term, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, that's a long, that's a long period of time to yeah. be persevering. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have, to, you have to focus yourself to get up out of bed every morning. I mean, yeah. for me on the weekend, I like the weekends, but I'm really, I really look forward to Monday mornings because Monday mornings like when the business starts and things get going mm. again and we're really... Mm. You know, ramping up. I mean, I really look forward to Monday mornings, you know. Okay. I look forward to most days that I'm working. It's just like a great thing, you know. But to have that perseverance in your business day after day, you know, hour after hour, minute after minute, like for an extended period of time, yep. it's quite difficult, you know. So that, that's really the key. But when you're running an organization itself, the key is the, the structure of the organization, hmm. the organizational structure. I mean, you have your goals and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but it's, it's the actual structure and the, the system that you put in place that makes mm -hmm. things work. Mm -hmm. So say, for example, if you're, you know, eight people looking to get an Olympic gold medal, yep. that's your goal. Yep. So those eight people, they all, they all have the same goal, right? But it's mm -hmm. the system that they put in place, the training system, the eating system, mm -hmm. the recovery system that they put in place is going to get them to achieve their goal. Only one person can achieve that goal. Yeah. And the rest of them will miss it. So, I mean, you can ask yourself, well, you know, you didn't have the proper goal and stuff like that. But actually, I mean, it's a system before they take part in the competition, which yeah. will decide whether they're going to be successful or not. And for us, it's always like about fixing the system, working mm. the system every day, mm. looking for like 1% improvements in how we can fix things up, how we can, you know, make the social media a little bit better, yeah. how you can improve the F&B, how you can improve the entrance, how you can improve the sense in the lobby. You know, all different things. I mean, we get our guys in all the hotels and the corporate office to always be focusing on how, how you can improve just a little bit, little bit, little bit. Because, mm -hmm. you know, there's big gains in small improvements, you know, short movements, like little bit, little bit, little mm -hmm. bit every day. And at the same time, not getting worse. Yeah. That's also important, right? But if you can make these small improvements over, you know, a long period of time and persevere with it, mm -hmm. after, uh, you know, 20 years like we've been in business, you have a very kind of well-structured, well-run organization, you know? So it's... It's a system that really kind of is the key to it. Mm -hmm. And we make sure like all the staff understand like the, the system is the, is, the, is the crown jewel. That's the key to uh, making a successful company. Yeah. With all of that, are you optimistic about the success of Archipelago in the next future? Not just in Indonesia, but also abroad? Yeah, for sure. Because I mean, we've built, I mean, our cost, I mean, our, most of our staff are here in Indonesia. So all the stuff, all the mm -hmm. core stuff we do is in Indonesia. So our cost base here is a lot less than it is, for example, overseas in Europe or the Middle East or the, or Ameri the Americas, for example, where salaries are much more expensive. And you can't find the people interested in doing it over mm -hmm. there. So our opportunity here is particularly in, you know, te hotel technology mm -hmm. or hotel distribution, connectivity, yeah. 
uh, yield management and so forth. We can do that here with the expertise we have here at a fraction of the cost they can do mm. it over there. So for them to outsource that system is a no-brainer. Mm. That's what you should be doing. Because I mean, there's no point hiring, you know, three people in Dubai at five thousand mm. dollars per month. Mm. You know, when you can hire, you know, outsource that service to us. So this for us, a lot of those services like either um, Powered by Archipelago or Centec or you know, licensing agreements and other stuff that we can do, distribution and stuff like that for hotels is is easy. It's much easier to do it here, you know. Mm. With the strong like strong basis of Archipelago. Strong base, yeah. I mean we've we've come out of COVID very strong. I mean, mm. really, really strong. Mm. I mean, with all the technology we need, all the expertise yeah. we need, the rejig thing, you know, uh, brands with a much better product market fit now. And then we also like, I mean, some of the products, for example, like um, what we do is, you know, freemium, you know, freemium, F freemium products mm -hmm. is like a freemium is so there's no, there's no upfront cost. So okay. if we're doing, so it's, it's just like a subscription, but you know, it just goes on. So as soon as the system mm -hmm. is set up, then you start paying. Yeah, yeah. So for example, if people are using the Sentec PMS or the Power by Archipelago service, there's no setup, there's no upfront fee, there's no setup cost or anything like mm -hmm. that. So even if it takes, for example, one or two months to set up the PBA or the yeah. Sentec system, there's no cost in that. We only start charging after yeah. it's set up and running, you know. So freemium product is like what the market it kind of is very good for the market. Because a lot of people, hotels, they don't want an upfront cost, right? Because they're not really sure how the system works, if yeah. it's good or not. But if you say, okay, well, it's a freemium product. It's yeah. like this, this, there's no cost until it's up and running. You can, you can expand mm. quite quickly doing that <laughs> if you have it in place, you know. Because, yeah, I mean, yeah. a lot of the things with... Uh, PBA or you know the Semtech PMS um, software in general is a lot of it is in the upfront cost. Mm -hmm. The actual running cost afterwards is not that is not that much. So once you find that sweet spot of you know value for money for people, you know That's a really key. good yeah a really good product market fit. But the pricing is good. The strategy mm -hmm. you know the the product really fits everything. So the product, mm -hmm. the price, the place, the promotion, how you do it all mm -hmm. fits. Then you can have a, a good run. You know so. Power by Archipelago, for example, the first six months were a bit slow because we were just adjusting that product yeah, market yeah. fit. But yeah. once you get that product market fit there and you get that sweet spot, then it really takes you off. You can know? go smoothly. Yeah, then you go. Then everything goes smooth because it's just a mm. product that people really need. They understand it. It's nice and simple. Mm. It doesn't cost them anything to set up. Mm. And then it's like it's in high demand. It's, I mean, most independent hotels, independent chains of hotels need this system because they don't have that expertise in-house. So are you sure or are you optimistic that Archipelago will be like number one hotel chain? I don't think we'll be the number one. I mean, our goal at the moment, <laughs> for example, last year we were number 42 in size in the world globally, mm -hmm. which is, is good for an Indonesian company. I mean, number 42 yeah, yeah. is I mean, it's, it's very good. Mm -hmm. um, our goal this, so that was, we got up to about 37,000 keys by the end of last year. So this yeah. year we expect to get to about 50,000 keys 50, in the system. Yeah. And that would put us in about uh, maybe number 32 or 33. But our goal is to get up to about, you know, 100,000, 200,000 keys overall through, you know, different types of, you know, management, licensing yeah. agreements, yeah. franchise agreements, joint ventures, mm -hmm. um, or powered by Archipelago. So that's the, that's the kind of goal for the next maybe 10 years. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Future. <laughs> you know, let's, let's see. The story, the story still has to be written, hopefully, a lot of the chapters, you know. But uh, yeah. so far, it's been a great journey. I mean, we really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I st we still have the same enthusiasm we did 20 years ago, even mm. probably more so now because, you know, we have a lot more people to work with. We have a lot more yeah. resources. We have a yeah. lot more systems in place. Um, and the world is like, is really going to boom for tourism in the next couple of years. I mean, yes. people are just, you know, after COVID you had, you know, people did a little bit domestic travel. And then after that they did, you know, build confidence. They did maybe two mm. or three hour flights. Mm. In the future then it's going to be back to long haul flights next year once airlines you know, can gear up with the amount of planes they have. Yes. They get all their flight paths back. Um, they, all their new routes are in, are in place. Mm. Um, Indonesia's got a great future because, you know, it's, you know, Bali's number one on the bucket list. I mean, the mm. government have done a great job putting in a lot of the infrastructure. Uh, but Sandy, Sandy is very, very busy yes. as Minister of Tourism. He's done a great job, very yeah. smooth. He's been consistent. He's had a good message to the market. Yeah. Um, so that's been very good. And he's been, you know, he's great working with the hotel companies. Mm. Um, you know, developing a, a cohesive plan, you know, to the domestic market, to the international market. Yes. So, uh, yeah, the future for us, we think, is very good for Indonesia. It's great for us. It's great. I'm looking forward to being a part of it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I do. Very good. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> for having us. I wish you uh, success. Very good. I hope, uh, hope everybody enjoyed it. I hope they understand it. I hope I didn't talk too, uh, <laughs> hope I didn't no. talk too quickly. Yeah.
But uh, no, yeah, no. thank you. Yeah. Thank you.